In Treasury's briefing to the incoming finance minister, um, just after the recent election, Treasury said fiscal policy will need to support economic activity, particularly as monetary policy is approaching its limits. At present, the risks of fiscal policy doing too little outweigh the costs of it doing too much. Um, so what further policies does Treasury believe might be needed to support the economy, especially if we see a, a double dip recession kind of scenario? Yeah. Um, we have been quite consistent in our advice that a strong fiscal response is necessary in the face of such an enormous economic shock. Uh, and also that fiscal response needs to be flexible and agile because we are operating in such an uncertain environment and uh, the economic outcomes are so closely tied to what happens uh, with, the course of, with the course of the virus. Um, so there's no magic number in terms of the uh, right amount of, uh, of fiscal stimulus, um, but um, what, is, uh, what, what government has, um, has allocated through the COVID response and relief fund is consistent with our advice. Um, in terms of fiscal support going forward, well, there's um, a very large task in implementing um, what has already been what has already been allocated, um, and also we have frameworks in place such that um, supports are triggered automatically in the event of an alert level um, rise. Mm -hmm. And so then that's like the wage subsidy, for example. That's if right. It's more than a week that we're in level three or four. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Wage subsidy, resurgent support payments. Mm -hmm. um, they're now linked. Um, effectively have automatic triggers to, um, to, 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 to kick in. And then there'll be choices for government ahead uh, and we're monitoring the economy closely. Um, and of course, the budget will be coming up in May. Um, in terms of uh, cash payments to, to people who might, sort of low income earners or higher benefits or some sort of higher COVID relief payment like we previously had if people lose their jobs due to COVID, that, those sorts of ways to support um, people most affected. Is that something you think might become necessary when sort of the, the longer term effects of COVID might really kind of hit the economy yeah. in a different way perhaps to what we saw in 2020? Yeah, but we provided advice to government on a range of different uh, economic supports and different supports have uh, different advantages, disadvantages, um, they're appropriate at different points in time. Um, all of those, all, all, all of those options are available to government, and it'll be a matter of government to choose what's the most appropriate type of support at what time. How concerned is Treasury about not creating zombie companies? Oh, this is one of the key decisions throughout the pandemic: is getting the balance right between supporting continuity of firms and making sure that we avoid business failures, avoid unnecessary business failures, um, avoid long-term unemployment. Um, and then on the other hand, a supporting adjustment where it's clear that it's simply not possible for all, all businesses to continue operating and we need to reallocate resources in other parts of the uh, economy. So that tension between continuity and adjustment is one that we've been very conscious of right from the start. Um, at the start of the pandemic, it's very important to maintain continuity, keep workers attached to their jobs, businesses uh, operating. Um, as time progresses, and that, that tension between um, you know, adjustment and uh, continuity becomes more important. But the fiscal support that is available now does, does account for both. Um, we've had wage subsidy, resurgent supports payments, but also mm. measures like um, support for apprentices, um, high benefit levels, and uh, uh, hiring subsidies which support more adjustment as well. Okay, um, right, okay, I think that answers that. Um, in terms of debt, but some people will be concerned about the amount of debt that um, the government has had to take on. Yeah. Treasury, again in its briefing to the incoming finance minister, um, said that strong management of revenue and expenses is required and kind of alluded to the reality that a tax hikes might be required in the future, saying that economic growth alone will be insufficient to secure long-term fiscal sustainability. At what point is it a good idea to start talking about tax hikes? Well, given, given the uncertainty in the economy, I view that it is um, not an appropriate time to be setting new debt targets. Our view is that debt levels are within prudent, within prudent um, uh, levels and uh, that uh, yeah, debt levels are manageable overall. Uh, we think that it'd be appropriate to revisit uh, the question of, of debt targets um, once the economy stabilises, once we're certain that we're closer to full, uh, full employment levels. And at that point, there will be choices for government as to um, how, they, how they wish to, um, to manage uh, debt. 
your predecessor before COVID-19 um, came along suggested that 30% of net core crown debt to GDP was a good um, sort of maximum level. Um, that, that was kind of the, the cap that was suggested. What do you think in a normal time once we get through the next few years um, is, a, is a prudent debt level? Yeah, I think there's no one single optimal number and Treasury's previous work really was about a framework for understanding prudent levels of debt. Uh, we're still operating within that framework. The sorts of things that um, matter include the sustainability of debt servicing payments and we know now that with uh, interest rates low and expected to remain low that um, servicing payments are, are within uh, acceptable bounds. Uh, we also look at market access, so the ability to access debt and we have a strong investor base um, and uh, you know, debt levels for New Zealand are um, quite favourable, comparable to, uh, compared to, uh, to, to other, other countries. And then importantly, we look at intergenerational welfare. So really the question is the trade-off between the benefits of additional debt now versus the costs of debt for future generations. And in a time of global pandemic, where there's a possibility of severe loss of lives, but also the possibility of severe economic scarring, um, our view that uh, the increase in debt is appropriate and still remains within um, prudent levels. Younger generations will be realising that um, you know we, we are carrying this uh, burden of um, COVID-19 and, and the debt that's been taken on um, and that is a potentially worrying situation especially as younger people are locked out of the housing market um, they also might have been the ones who have lost their jobs people young people entering the job market might have difficulty and then they've got this massive lump of debt to take on. Has Treasury thought about issuing a 100-year bond, for example, which would um, relieve the current generation from some of that debt burden? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's, that's a great question and um, it's something that we have given some thought to. I mean, there are really two perspectives on, um, on, on your question. One is just looking at it from an operational debt management perspective. So we're continually looking at better ways to um, to, to manage the debt uh, the debt program and uh, the sorts of things that we consider in issuing a longer term bond is whether or not there's an active investor interest for it, uh, the impact on um, investor diversity, um, whether or not the markets are um, developed. Um, the advantage of a longer term bond would be reducing refinancing risk, but on the other hand it's likely to come at a higher cost sure. because investors would um, want to have a term premium given the uncertainty. So there's that trade off um, from an operational perspective. But I think what your question is really getting to is who bears the costs of debt. And that is a separate question to how um, the debt is structured. So, for example, issuing a 100-year bond is broadly equivalent to issuing a 10-year bond and rolling it over 10 times. Um, really, the question of who bears the debt is a matter of fiscal policy and the choice that government has on um, when to pay that debt back. So you're um, talking about tax? That that's what you mean by that? Well, there are choices in terms of increasing revenue, there are choices in terms of managing expenses, reprioritising expenses so that uh, the pressure on, on, on expense can be managed um, at lower levels, and also um, strategies around growth driving productivity. Mm, okay. Um, with that bond, just in terms of um, the sort of appetite in the market, you, you know, you need someone to buy the thing. Mm. Um, if the, that's where the Reserve Bank could come in handy because the Reserve Bank could buy the 100-year bond. Um, the Reserve Bank's decisions on bond purchases are a matter for the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank, so that would be a matter for them. Our focus is on um, our debt program and uh, ensuring that we do have an active investor base um, and that uh, we deliver on all of our program's objectives. Okay, so what about taking a slightly different approach um, to, to what we've used at the moment and I guess do, do some, this I suppose would be money financing, I don't know if I have my technical terms right, but where Treasury issues the bond and the Reserve Bank buys it direct. Um, we don't see a need for um, money financing at, um, at, at, at this point. Um, we effectively have something uh, similar in terms of balance sheet impacts with the Reserve Bank's large scale asset programs, but monetary financing does um, 
have the potential to erode the institutional arrangements, but the independence of monetary policy and independence of inflation targeting, and also the possibility of eroding fiscal discipline as well. So we see that the current arrangements with uh, the Reserve Bank's large-scale asset program has similar sort of balance sheets impacts, but without the costs in terms of institutional uh, arrangements. Okay. Um, look, in terms of uh, the spending that the government has been doing, some of us might um, be getting struggling a little bit to keep up with how much of the money allocated to the COVID response, which is $62 billion. Not all of that has been allocated, but that's been set aside. How much of the $62 billion has gone out of the door? And the Auditor General suggested that the, the regular reporting um, that's required of the Treasury and the government doesn't sort of require such granular reporting and the Auditor General said it wants more information about where the money's going. Can you tell us what has been done to satisfy, to start satisfying the Auditor General's concerns and how much of the 62 billion has gone out the door? So I think it's important to note at the outset that um, Treasury is following all reporting requirements under the Public Finance Act. Um, those requirements involve reporting on an appropriation by an appropriation basis and that doesn't necessarily um, suit sorts of programs like the COVID response and, um, and, and, and relief fund which have large initiatives that might be spread across many different appropriations but we are following all requirements. Uh, we recognise the need and the interest in uh, more information about um, the, the, COVID, the COVID funding and so Treasury has um, now put on its website a detailed list of initiatives to show where the money has been allocated and we will be reporting on a quarterly basis um, for, with the information that we can um, get within the, uh, the current reporting systems to provide a, um, a, a measure of um, what has been spent to date. I think it's also important to note that a number of uh, agencies also have individual reporting, mm. NSD um, has reporting on the wage subsidy, um, Ministry of Women has uh, reporting on the, their allocations of, uh, of funding as well. So there is much more information that's available, but we do recognise the need for more transparency around the spend. We also published in our half-year update, um, we published a, a reconciliation of how much of the COVID fund had been allocated, mm. approximately $10 billion that's remaining from the original fund. So how much, do you know roughly how much of the $62 billion has gone out the door? I think the Auditor General estimated about $18 billion. So we don't. We have that information um, at an appropriation level, which doesn't allow us to exactly reconcile back to um, the original allocations. But what we know is that we've got about ten billion dollars that's unallocated still. Okay, but we don't know how much of the fifty-two billion then that's being allocated has actually gone into the economy. We have estimates and yep. that's what we're working on now is to make sure that we can pull together as much of that information as possible and we'll certainly, we certainly have the information where an individual appropriation is aligned with an initiative. Mm.